order or reconvene, excuse me, the May 21st Parker Town Council meeting at 7.02 p.m. Council, if you could please sign in. All council members are present with the exception of Councilman Josh Martin, who is out of town. Now, I know we've got some great youngsters in the room, so I'm going to ask a favor of you guys, something that you weren't expecting. But if you're under the age of 18, and I know we've got a couple staff members who are real close to under age 18, please come on down right up front, because you're going to lead us in the most important part of tonight. So if you're under 18, come on down. Now, when you go back, please make sure you sit in the same seat you are sitting in, because I know you guys have a specific order that you're supposed to do stuff, but this was like an impromptu little thing. You guys are going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. So what's going to happen is everyone behind you is standing up right now, and in just a second, we're going to turn around and face the flag. Y'all are going to put your hands on your heart, and we're all going to wait and listen. And when you start saying the pledge, everyone else will follow in. Okay? Sound like a deal? All right. should always be said by a big group of kids. Was that not the coolest sound thing? But hey, I'm going to give you a little Pledge of Allegiance trivia for you guys. Because the Pledge of Allegiance is actually said wrong about 99% of the time that you say it. Because when it was written, one nation under God is actually on one line. It's one sentence, one nation under God. And you'll notice that every time you say it, probably you hear most people go, one nation, pause, under God, but there's a few of us who will always like jump the gun and be like, one nation under God, because that's actually the correct way to say it, because it's written as one sentence, no pause. So now you can impress all your classmates when you go back and you can be the awkward one who goes, one nation under God. Okay? All right. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next item. We have a couple special presentations tonight. Rhonda, we have a special presentation. Come on, down. look, she's giving me looks. I know, that was a look like, uh, excuse me? No, I didn't know it was all right. Whoa, careful, careful. I just totally threw you off your game tonight, didn't I? You know what, Steve Steve Bedard right now, just like, look like this and grab his chest, wherever he is right now. Well, tonight is an example of how busy the finance department's been. I've been here, I think, a week short of a year now. Um, and we tonight are going to receive recognition for our 2016 CAPFER Award. So we have Olga Fujeris, who is the president of the Colorado Government Finance Officers Association, here to do the honors. Excellent. Everybody, um, I'm honored to be here today to, on behalf of the National Government Finance Officers Association to present the Certificate of uh, Achievement of ex for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the Town of Parker. This certificate was established uh, in 1946, and the purpose of this uh, award was to encourage and assist uh, government with preparation of their financial reporting. And all of this time, since 1946, um, uh, it was very well received and gained widespread recognition among um, an, an indicator of uh, excellence in financial accounting and reporting. To earn this certificate, there is a very intense um, uh, criteria and demanding for which that goes beyond the minimum requirements for generally accepted accounting principle rules. And for the town of Parker, this is not their first award. They received it since 1988, for 29 years. And um, such record reflect the dedication and uh, commitment and hard work of all of the uh, employees, as well as the excellent leadership of the council members and the mayor. Uh, the Government Finance Officers Association 
hope that giving these awards to the town of Parker will encourage other governments to excel in their financial reporting. And now, it's my privilege, on behalf of the Government Financial Officers Association, to present the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting <coughs> to their town and park. Fantastic. All right, next presentation we have up is Town of Parker and Police Recognition. And let's see here, we're going to have Corey Stark come on down. Watch that step that Rhonda showed you earlier. Take it slow, take it slow. It's okay. They were built for To just jump All right. Well, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, Chief King, President Company, uh, what an honor to be here with you tonight. So thank you very much. My name is Corey Stark. Um, I'm with the state of Colorado. I work out for the Division of Homeland Security um, and Emergency Management. I'm a regional field manager. I'm a coordinator in all hazards disaster response for the state, supporting local governments like the town of Parker and our great counties across Colorado. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and, and I thank you. Um, we did bring a slide deck, which I hope that you can see or have some visual love in front. Thank you. Okay. Is it up top? It's up top. Um, I've established a nod with my slide changer, so I'll give you the first one. And I'd like to uh, just quickly give you a snapshot and an, uh, an agenda of what we're going to talk about. But first, I'd like to introduce my colleagues that I brought with me who are part of this journey. Uh, Mr. Kevin Credich, uh, the Northeast Regional Field Manager for Colorado, and Mr. Drew Peterson uh, to my right and left. And um, I also would like to go ahead and ask officers Don Cashman and Dorian Jerkers to come on down with us for two reasons. One, this is their day. We're excited to be able to acknowledge the great efforts of these two, and I want to give you a snapshot of what uh, 14 days looked like with these uh, these fine folks. So, Don, I don't know how you come over here with Kevin. <laughs> now, funny story, um, Kevin insisted on driving on um, the very first part of this until he realized that uh, Don was a decorated officer and could drive pretty well. <laughs> but Kevin, for the first time, gave up the keys and a journey through the Florida Keys. And, They've been best friends ever since. <laughs> so uh, real quick, uh, we're going we're gonna to work through a, a, a series of acknowledgments, a quick uh, recap of the story, um, a couple of uh, parting shots, and then we'll get out of your way. But uh, we're very excited to be here. So again, thank you. Ma'am, I'll uh, hit you for the next uh, next picker. Um, on, uh, on September, in September, we took a, 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 a benchmark journey down to, to Florida to help support local governments. Um, who are dealing with a hurricane of epic proportion. And so um, with that, this is our first opportunity to publicly thank uh, Don Cashman and Doreen Jokers for the efforts that they provided, those folks in, in, in Florida and Monroe County specifically, the state of Colorado and our partnership to support emergency operations centers and disaster managers across, across the nation. So um, first of all, um, we'd like to thank them um, with a great round of applause to both, because we're very grateful. about them, um, it's, it's the very truth. Um, I've known Don and, and Doreen a very long time in, in the work we do in, in this region and this part of uh, Colorado, and they've been great partners. And uh, without great partners, we can't do great work. So that's the first and foremost. Um, I've promised Kevin and Drew an opportunity to, to make a few statements on each as they present a thank you from the state of Colorado uh, for their walls of, of acknowledgement. So Kevin, I'll start with you, sir. Again, thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, the one thing I can say about Don, didn't know Don until we were deployed on a hurricane. And uh, Corey's right, I, it's hard for me to give the car keys up, especially in the middle of a hurricane. But uh, Don uh, uh, assured me that she's uh, an FTO. I, too, come from a law enforcement background, but it's been 20 years since I've had a car partner. So in 14 days that we were down, she definitely put me through the field training operations course again. <laughs> did right. she spin a few donuts out for you to show her how to lay some tread? Everything possible in a vehicle, yes. <laughs> but uh, it's my honor to uh, present uh, Dawn for the uh, certificate from the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And also a... Uh, Just call 
Oh, just call her. Just call her. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, job well done. Thank you. And thank you. So once again, thanks for having us. Um, I want to say that um, a lot of us have been doing this a long time, you know, from a standpoint of supporting local governments, going out on national disasters and um, disasters in Colorado, and trying to help stabilize the local communities. And it was amazing um, watching um, Doreen and Don operate, step in, do what needed to be done, do it with a smile, because in some cases, you know, what, what actually they were asked to do, some people wouldn't have considered it all that exciting. They, they, they initially identified food as being the, the biggest need that the EOC down there needed, and they jumped right in, and they did it, and they wielded more influence um, through how they helped get food to, you know, almost 200 people. Um, that were trying to stabilize the keys. And I must say, I learned so much, and there's, you know, I, when I have something happen in Western Colorado, you know, I want these two right there to help support the local um, governments and help them through. So, Doreen, I'd like to present this to you from the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Thank you. Slide. So, um, as you probably have heard, um, again on the on the hurricane in, in Florida, it was an epic an epic uh, event for us. And so we spent um, several days talking about uh, how we could support these local governments in the Florida in the Florida areas that were impacted. And a, a very deep discussion started to evolve into a, a real probability that we were going to be able to go down there and aid and offer the planning support that we do as professionals on a daily basis in an environment that had unknown um, impacts, unknown risks to us, un unknown, um, uh, unknown travel itineraries <laughs> in, in every possible way. Um, we found ourselves in an environment where we landed in Tallahassee, Florida and had to work down to the, to the Florida Keys. And, if you'll slide to the next uh, next screen, it was a four-day journey um, that got us down to a to a place uh, in, in a beautiful place in, in the southernmost part of, uh, of Florida. Uh, we had to do it with a, a team of, of professionals, and so we put out a local call to a lot of a lot of key talent and, and, and individuals that knew how to do this work. And so, as you just start to um, view the images that we have for you as we work through this, this presentation. I just wanted you to get a glimpse of who, um, who in, this, in the state um, stepped up to do this work to, to include your two officers here. And, and of course, when they called each of the regional field managers and asked who would you put up first, well, it came without question that these two were, were going. Um, which is why special thanks to Chief King because we know it wasn't an easy ask with 24 to 48 hours to say, all right, let's get on an airplane and let's go down and start doing some work that we really didn't know what was gonna, what was gonna be. So, uh, this was the talent, this was the crew that went, and if you'll advance for me one more time now. Um, we found ourselves working, working down uh, to a, to, in a journey that would, would take us to these images. And as you just capture these couple that you see in front of you, there are thousands and thousands of pictures that can show every, every turn and um, every, uh, every impact um, down there. And, and it's hard to pull just a couple of them to give you a quick snapshot, but the four-day journey is what, what, what got us to the spot. And as Drew alluded to, um, we were outsiders. We came from the upper Midwest, a thousand miles from Florida. We came from a state where there aren't any hurricanes. So what do we know about hurricanes? Well, what we knew was we knew how to work with people. We knew how to ask the right questions. We knew how to leverage the right people um, to connect with the right folks to do good work. So if you'll uh, advance for me again, this is where we found it uh, time to, as I said, punch in. We had to connect with all the right folks um, to do the right work. Now this job, as you view these images and see the different people that are involved, um, is sometimes the hardest part of getting started is making the right handshake and making the right connectivity to the problem solvers. And, and then really finding out what do they need to put their community back together. Because the hurricane, while it was still hanging around in some parts of Florida, it was it was it had done its damage here, 
it was time to start cleaning up. And that cleanup was a massive undertaking that this Colorado kid had never seen before, um, and, and hope maybe never to, um, you know, from the standpoint of a, of a, of a hurricane type disaster. Um, you almost don't know where to start. And in some cases, when we got to Florida Keys, we recognized that not everybody did know where to start. They were just trying to figure out how to make sense of what was in front of them. And so that's where we started putting the right people in the right place to just say, well, have you thought about this? Or maybe we can put this piece together. And to Drew's point about something as, as basic as our human need in food, well, there wasn't much food down there. It was destroyed in, in the Floridians. They know how to get food in the hurricane. They want to stay they stockpile. But with the talents, um, folks got out and really was able to find a way to start leveraging um, supplies um, and, and procure those things that we needed to keep doing business. And, 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 and handshakes, and if you'll go forward to the, to the next slide, um, was not only inside the emergency operations center there in the county, but it was outside. Who better to send out in a, in a community of unknowns than two decorated officers? And, and Doreen and, and Don both um, stepped right into that role and started to work with those community partners and really start to make sense of, hey, this is what we're dealing with and how can we help? I draw your attention to the top picture there with the uniformed uh, gentleman in the center, that's the sheriff of Monroe County. As a sheriff, um, you know, he knew the impacts that he was dealing with and trying to keep peace in his community. And, and you know, when we looked at, um, who better to put in front of him and help get things moving and Doreen reached out and started having conversations with him and you know finding access that we probably would have never been able to find and, and it's in those access points that we were able to do the things that we did to make uh, to make things uh, better in some capacity for the period of time that we were there so it was inside duties it was outside duties and those outside duties we learned a lot because we got to see a lot and uh, someday we're gonna uh, be able to go back there and, and find our way around for a a margarita instead of a, an MRE. <laughs> um, but with that said, um, I'd like to draw your attention to the next slide. And um, Monroe County reached out uh, to Green and, and Dawn, and you know they, they kept lasting relationships, and that's what they do. And so it was a great honor to be able to tie back into those folks. And when they heard that we were going to start um, having an opportunity to publicly thank our, our partners who went out went out there and, and helped us. Kevin, Drew, myself, and, um, and two others that aren't here tonight, um, helped us succeed in our leadership attribute to take these folks down there and, and to make sense from the state state perspective. From state state official leads, you know, we each took um, seven or eight uh, local government partners, and you know, it was a big job and a big responsibility to make sure that we were um, meeting everybody's needs. So. Um, as we got going down there, those folks, um, they made lasting partnerships and, and they reached out and said, you know, we want to do this too. We can't physically come, but we want to we thank, um, thank the, the officers and Doreen and Don. So with that, when both these gentlemen are going to hand um, off the um, plaque that the mayor of Monroe County sent down. Now, oh, that's uh, fancy. It might be tricky. It's very fancy. I know it's going to be hard to I know. Mine are just not like white pieces of paper. Look at that. That's Fancy. So without uh, without without going through the whole thing, it does uh, it is an honorary um, uh, a document here to honor Don and, and Doreen from the Mayor County, making them honorary uh, members of the the Key West community. They have carte blanche access to everything in Monroe County. <laughs> you still have to pay for everything. Like yeah. Casey smiling in the back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they really did um, have equal um, equal love for the, the work that was going on down there by our power partners and, and the town partners. So, so with that, you can read all the rest. Um, congratulations on your honorary conch status. Uh, conch, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Again, planning is important. Uh, communities have to take their part in making sure that we're um, preparing our communities for disasters of any kind. And the town of Parker has been a key uh, player in that effort. Uh, Doreen um, has kept that uh, planning cycle moving forward every year for the town of Parker. The chief um, supports those efforts. So from a state partnership, we really appreciate everything that town of Parker does. 
We, uh, we have to bring the right people to the table. And I feel like we did that. It was key in the success. Um, and I think that you know we continue to work and even a thousand miles away from home, we find the things that didn't work and figure out ways to do things better, take care of our people, um, because people are what uh, make this business uh, work. And my final slide, ma'am, and we'll take you to close. Um, again, we thank you, um, Town Parker, Chief, um, for giving up um, your employees' times for this effort, the rain gone. We thank you for making us look good and, and, and helping us succeed in our effort down there. Um, we can't do it alone. So thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your time tonight, and congratulations to both. person so when you come on up you're going to state your name and address for the record then you're going to start your public comment no action will be taken on these items it's just an opportunity for you to talk to the town um, again if you're here for a specific item on the agenda that will be later on you'll have public comment on that individual item so we'll open up public comment at 725 I know we got some youngsters here for public comment right here's the first rule smile relax it's really really easy Okay, yeah, like thumbs up. All right, so ladies, you guys ready? Pioneer Hero, come on down. You know what, actually, Jim, would you grab the mic and put it on the lower section? Because, yeah. <laughs> Will it stretch down there? Yeah, that's how it's. All right. So if you state your name for us, please. My name is Ella. This is Elmer, Jamie, Keller, Ava, and Devin. And um, we are here from Pioneer Elementary School to speak to you about our one school, one cause. Our one school, one cause main focus this year was childhood poverty, and our group was focusing on affordable housing for families. Now with that, we please welcome my fellow peers who will be speaking to you tonight. Parker businesses need workers at all wage levels, including minimum wage earners, in order to be successful. Businesses need to attract the workers to come to Parker. Schools need nurses and janitors. Stores need cashiers. Lower income workers in Parker are struggling to find affordable housing. An article in the newspaper said that to afford a two bedroom apartment in Parker, you must earn almost $22 an hour. Minimum wage is $10 an hour. Many families are single wage, are single income, and cannot afford an apartment. We need all types of workers so our community can run correctly. We need different housing options in order to attract and maintain businesses. We need low rent apartments so that waiters, cashiers, nurses, police officers, and others can afford to live and work in our community and keep our businesses running. Some of our classmates are moving away from Parker because their families cannot afford to live here. After we graduate, it's important for us to be able to move back to our community. We want to be able to return to Parker to begin our lives and start families. Unfortunately, 
There are not a lot of affordable housing options for people just entering their careers. Parker needs to consider more low-income housing options. We hope that our community will be more welcoming to all types of housing that Parker needs, especially for our young families, the elderly, our labor force, and our public workers. Thank you for your time, and good night. Awesome. I live at 12224 South Season Court, and thank you for your time tonight. I'm here again to talk to the council about the parking problem at Iowa Wild neighborhood. Uh, I was in six months ago, and at that time I said, we do not have a public parking problem, but we do have a problem being the high school parking lot. And this is a picture of um, the high school parking in uh, this month on our street, 27 cars uh, across eight homes. Little, this is a little full, as you can tell, and there were more cars going across um, into other adjacent streets, too. This is what our street looks like on a normal day in our neighborhood during the week. As you can see, we don't park in the street, so it is it's a huge difference being the parking lot for the high school. I also 
wanted to share some of the um, other fun activities we get to deal with. We're literally starting to see drug paraphernalia on the street now. We have trash on the street all the time. They drop food on the street. It's just it's getting worse and worse year over year. So what my ask is, again, is let's think about safety. Um, we have, we figure about um, 50 cars coming through our neighborhood from the high school three, four times a day. They come in the morning, they leave at lunch, they come back at lunch, they leave in the afternoon. We have parents doing drop-off in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood's not designed for this kind of volume of traffic. Um, we also have students now accosting, we're way accosting neighbors um, on the street when they ask them to get off their trees because they're starting to break the trees and harm them. The students are coming over and cursing out the neighbors in very foul language in front of elementary aged kids. Um, and also we're starting to be impacted now on property value. We have a home that's for sale on season court. Um, the homeowner got a couple of offers and um, the offers they specifically said they were 10% less in value because of the street parking on our, on our street. We've got a $700,000 home, 10% cut. You know, that's a lot of money. It's starting to get really painful. Um, also, the, uh, we had another person that made an offer in the house, but they wanted to see what the high school parking was like. So they sat in the neighborhood and watched a day of the life of our street. And they came back to this homeowner and they said, we're not going to make an offer. There's too many kids coming back in onto the street smoking pot during the day. So, you know, we've been here year after year. We've got the school for help year after year. School's not doing anything. They're making it worse. They're adding more kids into their student population. So it's getting, um, it's getting pretty bad. Um, there's other communities that have solved this problem. We've seen how the Chaparral High School area has solved this problem. Other areas have done permit. We're not, I'm not here to solve it today, but just saying, guys, it's getting worse. And so please help. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really do. All right. Next up, name and address, please. Hi. Thank you. I'm Patrice Batchelor. I live at 12206 South Season Court, um, directly across from the community center. Um, I'm, I'm here because of my son, and these kids uh, today really uh, warmed my heart. Uh, he's about their age, he's nine years old, um, and uh, we were driving down the street the other day, and we can only go in the center of the street because of the cars parked on both sides. So we get to the end of the cul-de-sac at the stop sign, and the high schooler just comes flying into that and almost you know, directly head-on collision. So um, <laughs> I'm here um, asking for your help. And we've got a dangerous situation. It's no longer unmanageable. We've tried to be very patient. I'm a huge supporter of our schools, huge supporter of Legend High School, but this has become completely unmanageable. And no one seems to want to own the problem. Uh, like Terry said, uh, the police have been amazing. They've done what they can do, but it, you know, it's out of their jurisdiction for some of this, this problem. So we keep getting the runaround. Uh, keep getting the runaround from you know, who owns the problem and uh, it's, it's really frustrating. And I would say, if we don't do something about it, some child is gonna get hurt, and it's gonna be all on our hands uh, because we didn't do anything about it. So um, <laughs> I get really emotional when I talk about my son. So, uh, You're fine, don't worry. The other thing is, my understanding is that the neighborhood was formed first, and that it was actually zoned to be a middle school, never a high school. So the enrollment issue that Terry talked about and the increase in enrollment was, I don't think, something that, that was originally envisioned for, for that neighborhood. So um, again, the problem is only going to get worse. I've lived in the house for about um, five and a half years now. I've seen it get worse. Um, you know, approximately 200 cars, if you total that up, what Terry said, coming down our cul-de-sac every single day is, again, unmanageable. So <laughs> we're, we're asking for your help, uh, someone to please help. Um, my understanding is that that rests with the town of with, with the town of Parkford. Um, I'm a former journalist. I'm a former newspaper reporter. Um, that's what I do for a living now. I deal with the media every day, and uh, we don't want to escalate it. We but, but but we don't know what else to do, and so we're asking again for your help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up. Karen Swanford and I um, moved to South Season Court in 2016 and we bought the house early April. Um, and we moved from Hidden River from a cul-de-sac there that was quiet, so I was excited to move to another cul-de-sac. And um, by the middle, middle of April, we noticed we had a parking lot in front of us. So uh, that wasn't 2016, 2017 was, was pretty bad. And this year, it's, just, it's been pretty bad. I run every morning 
When I come back, I take license plate numbers, I call the Parker Police, and they have been fabulous. Every time I call, they're there ticketing in front of the fire hydrant in front of our house. Um, and across the street, there's no parking sign, and they park, the kids park right in front of it. So they're easy, easy sites um, for the police to find when I call. And they've been very gracious, very um, on top of it. But um, there is a problem when there's two cars are parked on both sides of the street. So when I pulled out of my driveway, they're young drivers. They're the youngest and newest drivers of, um, of Legend High School because they don't have parking permits. So they're, um, they're high risk. So they come, they come, a girl came down our street very fast and they drive quickly. Um, and maybe they're going 20 miles an hour, but it's, it's too fast and I call the sack with them on cars. And we almost had to head on just to be backing out to, there's no room for four lanes of traffic in the cold set. Um, I appreciate your, your ears and um, any solutions you might have to help us. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Leslie Pacheco, and I'm on the 22206 East Idlewild Drive. I'm on the corner of Idlewild and Susan basically. Um, there is a fire hydrant directly in front of my house. Um, and we have a two car driveway versus a lot of the ones on the three car driveway. Um, we have four cars. We have two in the garage, and then we have to use our street parking for um, the other two cars. The problem we have, obviously, is we have a fire hydrant out front, and honestly, even if we didn't, we wouldn't have parking. Um, they park right up to our driveway. They park all the way down season court, so we have no parking on the side of our house either, which originally when we moved there, we did. Um, and then now they're parking across from us, which blocks our driveway. So if my son is home, um, backing out of the driveway, I have to manipulate the car on the side, the cars behind me, and his car to the side of me. Um, on top of the cars that come flying through, because they don't yield to you when you're backing out, um, and you can't always see them coming around the corner. Um, working from home that I do, sometimes I don't have to navigate that traffic, and it's fine, and sometimes I do. I mean, it's just in and out, you know, throughout the day. Um, being home and being on that corner, I see a lot of the problems that happen. Um, they're building all of season court as much as they can, and then as they come out, they just kind of park wrong directions or right directions, either way, but they're parking, covering up that corner. So when people are coming around the bend, they have a blind side. They don't, they can't see what's coming at them, and they can't see who's coming out of the cul-de-sac because of the amount of cars that are butted up to the corners. Um, the police do come out. They do. I've seen them come out and, and you know patrol and try to move cars out of the way. But there are many times where they block driveways and you know nearly cause collisions. My husband's almost been hit twice. We have a neighbor across the street who sent me a story to mention today that her husband was backing out. They live on Season Court, and he was backing out and was almost hit. Um, and then proceeded to get yelled at by the person who almost hit them. So it's it's difficult. Um, we've had kids climbing in our trees <laughs> because we have the longest road there. We have several trees. And so um, our neighbors across the street tried to help. And they were cursed at and approached by the kids. Um, and she had a little fear for her son being in the, in the garage with her. So it's just, it gets to the point where it's too extreme now. Um, Going to school is one thing, coming in at the end of May was another thing, but now it's, it's all year long. And the school takes no responsibility and they oversaw the parking lot, so they kind of caused the problem as well. So hopefully you can help us solve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Public comment? Anyone else for public comment? <laughs> name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Michael Farrow. Um, I live at 21806 East Idlewild Drive. Um, I am the Idlewild HOA president this year. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. Uh, Someone was just about to get a sucker out, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Back here. 
I'm also a little bit surly tonight, you'll have to bear with me. My wife made me wear a suit. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you not Yeah, and a shade. Yeah, I didn't that. That's too, too bad strikes on my part. Um, so I'm here to lend a voice the uh, Iowa HOA last month voted to support the residents of South Season Court on their parking issue and come and lend our voice in supporting their issues. I also would like to request that when we look at solutions, and I am here to volunteer, I, if the city wants to put together a task force with community members, I will be more than happy to volunteer my time to try to address these issues. But when we look at these issues, I don't want to pass the buck to another street. Um, so when we look at it, I want to make sure we're addressing it from a holistic standpoint uh, with the school and the school district. I am more than happy to uh, sit on any task force to try to come up with solutions and volunteer my time for that. I, do I have an answer today? No, I don't, but I'm more than happy to put my time and energy uh, to that. Uh, so this is my first time coming to the uh, council meeting and uh, my first time volunteering. This is how I got in trouble before. <laughs> uh, warned me to don't do it. Um, but uh, I guess uh, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> there are uh, two other issues I want to address uh, very quickly. Um, one is the corner of East Idlewild Drive and East Stroll Drive. Um, so for, for those uh, that, that don't know this intersection, this is one of our four school bus stop locations uh, in Idlewild. We had a young lady who was uh, hit by a car about a month ago, fractured her hip in four places. Um, this happens to be a launching point coming off the street before from a four-way stop down and around a very fast curve. Um, I started looking at the four school bus stop locations in our community and none of them have pedestrian crossings. They are all school bus um, locations for the young kids that were sitting right here in front of you today. Um, from a pedestrian standpoint, I find it concerning that we don't mark our school bus locations and or we don't put peg crossings in. Something to catch drivers' attention is to say, hey, something's different at this location. We need to pay attention. I think at the very minimum, that should be a holistic approach from the entire city standpoint, but for sure, at least in a couple of these high traffic areas. I only have 30 seconds, so I'll move on to my last one. And I'll let you roll a little bit, so you're good. Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, my last one is an invitation for you all to come take a look um, at a, brand, a, a new park, it's not new. Um, it's, I have photos of it that was established in June of 2015. Um, it is located between 21775 East Idlewild Drive and 21735 East Idlewild Drive. So I do have pictures of the playground being established in June of 2015. I counted today, it has not been turned over to the HOA yet. It is still under the developer's control. I counted this morning, this is the third time they've replaced trees, 17 dead ones. There's 24. It's actually statistically very hard to kill 17 trees out of 24 over the winter. Um, this park has been there for three years. The community is 80% developed in this location at this point. I don't know whose job it is to oversee how developers come in and how they put in amenities in communities. I, I don't know. As a, as a resident of this neighborhood, I'm embarrassed. As the HOA president, I'm embarrassed. You know, I don't know how we oversee this stuff or, or what kind of time frames these things take place, but three years, I don't, it doesn't pass a reasonable test in, in my opinion. So I'm gonna leave you with that. Um, I'll, I'll ask you to go ahead and wait through the meeting and then I'll get you my business card at the end. Or if you, if you wanna pull my email address off of the town's oh, website sure. and email me it and then we'll make sure to get the right staff person to contact I invite them. all of you to come and take a look at this place. It is um, mind-boggling, to be honest. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, good, good luck to you this year, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, anyone else have for public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll close public comment at 7.46 p.m. and I'll move to reports, items, and comments from Mayor and Council. Amy, do you have anything for us? <coughs> several events honoring our police officers last week, one of uh, which most of us, I think, here uh, did attend was the police awards dinner, and it was recognizing all of our officers for some of their outstanding accomplishments in protecting our community and helping uh, our citizens throughout the year. And we did have a cultural and scientific commission meeting. Council member John Dyack was attendance with that one. Uh, for fun, Wilson Phillips 
I remember from the 80s. I know. Like, <laughs> I, I had asked Elaine to let me like open that show because I was a serious like Wilson. Oh, like, oh my crazy. gosh, yeah. And oh, darn. I didn't get notified. I know. I oh, wanted, I wanted to be fun. there. That would have been fun. And then also just in support of uh, Parker Arts, we also held a um, living room concert at the home of John and Kelly Gibson uh, just yesterday, last night. And that's for family circle members. And so it's just one of the great membership benefits that you have of supporting the arts here in Parker. <coughs> we had about maybe, I don't know, I know the RSV number was maybe 80 people. It seemed like it was more around maybe the 50-ish. But it was just a very intimate evening. And our performer was Daphne Willis. And she was just outstanding. Uh, songwriter, musician, singer, she's just incredible. And then also, uh, council member Ed Lewis and I attended a funeral for Aurora Mayor Steve Hogan this past weekend. And I think, you know, on behalf of all of us, we just like to extend our love and prayers to the Hogan family, including Becky Hogan, who was a former employee here at the town apartment. So, uh, one other thing, all of our kids left, but that was really awesome to have our students come in and give presentations, and I really like to encourage our other schools to do the same as well. Okay. Renee. I've been sick. <laughs> All right. Debbie. I've been out of town, but I was back in time for the uh, Police Awards dinner. I believe that was Thursday night. Mm -hmm. uh, it was wonderful. We do have an officer that uh, this was his 35th year. Uh, so that was that was wonderful. Uh, officer Gerlach. And I uh, attended the um, the the in-home uh, what's called Living Room Concert, uh, Parker Arts uh, put on at Johnny Kelly's house uh, last evening, and uh, it was outstanding. I don't always say that. I'm just saying that they don't always have the kind of music that I like, but um, the, the, we, as Amy said, we did attend our funeral on Saturday. Um, it was quite the list of folks that were there, and we, we started off, uh, they started off with the song, and the guy, you know, I had a man sitting next to me, and I had to tear my tissue in half to give him half because he was in as bad a shape as I was. So it was, it was really um, a wonderful ceremony and a, a celebration, and the week I got to talk to Becky for a few minutes and said that, you know, everybody in, in Parker is, uh, is, is thinking about her here town hall that she worked with. So did anyone share the final song we sang during all oh. and Mayor Hogan had scripted the entire Ceremony. funeral celebration. The, the entire the entire thing. Who spoke what happened, the music, everything. And at the end we all stood at, at his, his 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 written request and sang Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Mm -hmm. So that was that was uh, it was it was it was good that we were there. John, thanks, Mayor. Um, I think my highlight was uh, going to a Dr. Cog meeting. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't want to be uh, repetitive, but uh, Dr. Cog uh, discussion was a state legislative wrap up, which um, you know the highlight was uh, looks like we're going to get some state transportation funding. And uh, an RTD presentation um, from uh, Dave Genova, their executive director. So that, that is all there. Josh? No, let's see. Ditto. Okay. All right, awesome. So we're going to move to the next item, which is our consent agenda. Consent agenda items are considered to be routine. Passed with one motion and one vote, unless a council member asks to have something removed for further discussion. So council, tonight we've got consent agendas items 6A through 6 J, and my understanding, go ahead, Amy. Mayor, I will abstain from voting for item A, so if I may, I'd like to move to approve consent, consent agenda items 6B through J. Second. Okay, motion by Amy for consent agenda items 6B through 6J, and a second from Debbie. Council, please vote. Motion passes unanimously, and then I'll need a motion for 6A. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve item 6A. Second. Motion by Josh for 6A and a second by Debbie. Yeah, yeah. Council, please vote. Motion passes with one abstention from uh, Councilwoman Amy Holland. All right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Next item up on our agenda is items 7A and 7B. These are two items that will be done with one presentation. These are 7A is ordinance number 2.259.1 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance affirming the passage of emergency ordinance number 2.259 series of 2018, a bill for an emergency ordinance approving and accomplishing the annexation of contiguous unincorporated territory known as the Grasslands Prairie Trail property in Douglas County. And then item 7B is ordinance 3.333.1 on second reading, which is a bill for an ordinance affirming the passage of emergency ordinance number 3.333, series of 2018, a bill for an emergency ordinance zoning certain property within the town of Parker, Colorado, known as the Grasslands Prairie Trail property to PD Plan Development District, pursuant to the town of Parker Land Development Code and amending the zoning ordinance and map to conform therewith. Mr. Maloney. Good evening, Mayor and Council. On uh, April 16th uh, of this year, you passed ordinance number 2.59 series of 2018, and this was an emergency ordinance to annex land commonly known as grasslands. On that same evening, you also approved as an emergency measure ordinance number 3.333, and this was an ordinance to zone property commonly known as the grasslands property. Under the uh, town charter, because this was adopted as an emergency measure, uh, you have to ratify that in order for the ordinance to become permanent. And you have to do so within 90 days, and this is certainly within the 90-day period. So if you approve um, ordinance number 2.59.1, you will have ratified the action that you took on April 16, 2008, concerning the annexation. And if you approve ordinance number 3.331 on second reading, you will affirm the zoning ordinance that was approved that evening as ordinance number 3.333. Any questions, Mayor, Council? Council, questions? No? All right, we're going to open up public comment at 7.54 p.m. And since there are no public in the audience, just staff members, unless a staff member wants to come up for public comment. I think we're going to close public comment. Chris is thinking about it. He's thinking about it. All right, we're going to close public comment at 7.54 p.m. and I'll entertain further discussion or two separate motions, please. I move to approve ordinance number 2.259.1, second reading. Second. Motion by John and a second by Debbie. Council, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next item. I move to approve ordinance 3.333.1. One on second reading. Second. Motion by Debbie, second by Amy. Council, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next item is item 7C. This is ordinance number 1.466.3 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to amend section 4.9 of the Town of Parker Personnel Manual concerning military leave. Tara, you're going to lead the show. But just for a moment. Just for a moment. Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you for having us tonight. Um, with me tonight, I have Christina Worley. She's our benefits and wellness administrator. And uh, before you tonight, you do have a bill for an ordinance to amend Article 4, the benefits and leave section of our personnel manual. And because Christina is the benefits and wellness administrator, I thought it was fitting for her to go ahead and share briefly uh, with you all tonight uh, the reason for this um, uh, change in our personnel manual. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So the town recently had two of its employees uh, deployed to active military service, um, one for a period of eight months and the other for a period of 14 months. Our human resources department has also recently undergone um, some staffing changes. So in light of those changes and the two active uh, deployments, we thought it would be best to analyze our current military policy just to ensure that it's in compliance with state and federal guidelines, as well as favorable to our employees who are serving in the military. So upon extensive research, uh, we did come to find that the Town of Parker Personnel Manual, Section 4.9 Military Leave is actually in violation what is, with what is called USERA guidelines and regulations. Um, USERA stands for Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. It is a federal law that outlines the rights and responsibilities of um, uniformed service members and their civilian employers, which would be the town in this case. 
So uh, approval of the personnel policy change to the military uh, policy would put us into compliance with USERRA. So that is what we are proposing. Thank you, and I will take any questions that you guys have. Excellent, thank you very much. Council, any questions? Tim, is this your first time in front of council? Yeah. <laughs> Bang up job. Bang up job. Good job. All right. And with that, we'll open up public comment at 7.57. How does somebody want to throw down some questions about USERA and uniformed officers? No? All right. We're going to close public comment at 7.57. I'll entertain further discussion or a motion, please. I move to approve ordinance number 1.466.3. Second. Second. Motion by Josh and a second by Amy. Council, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. That's what he's here. Oh, that's why Chris is here at a tie. All right, next item, item number D. But he does have on the standard blue. He does have the standard engineering blue on today. That's correct. Should we go with the WKRP voice for him? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we'll do Mayor, I've talked to you about uh, <laughs> Wilson Phillips. <laughs> about Wilson Phillips? <laughs> you lost a couple man points. <laughs> No, specifically just the blonde. I thought she was totally hot when I was young. All right, item D, this is ordinance number 9.273 on second reading. This was continued from May 7th, 2018. This is a bill for an ordinance to approve the intergovernmental agreement between the town of Parker and Parker Water and Sanitation District regarding public improvements, security, and before we go on, can, I, can we do both of these in one presentation? Okay. That's what I was going to say. And then we'll also do uh, item E, which is ordinance number 9.274 on second reading, continued from May 7th, 2018, which is a bill for an ordinance to approve the intergovernmental agreement between the town of Parker and Cottonwood Water and Sanitation District regarding public improvements, security. Mr. Hudson. Rock and roll. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight, you have uh, two ordinances in front of you that are actually interrelated. Uh, late last year, we started a dialogue with Codwood Water and Sanitation District regarding Kings Point Way, a proposed roadway that's going to go from Codwood Drive up to Aurora Parkway uh, outside the town limits. What we found is that uh, Codwood Water and Sanitation District wanted the same agreement that we had with Parker Water and San where we've been waiving public security requirements back and forth. As I pulled on the string, I found that it was a handshake agreement between us and Parker Water and Sanitation District that we've had in place for the last 10 years. Uh, public security is something that every governmental agency does. Uh, development tends to be speculative in nature, but the way it works with governments in Colorado, you have to budget and appropriate it. So nothing is done speculative here in, here in the state. And so what we're doing is actually Parker Water and Sand is getting that agreement in place, and, Park, and Cottonwood Water and Sand has the same agreement. Ultimately, we're going to extend this to Cotton or to Stonegate Water, uh, Stonegate Village Metropolitan District, because they have people and facilities here in the town of Parker. Uh, securing public improvements is it adds costs and bureaucracy to uh, any project that you do. So this is a way that we can cut down on. It's a minor part of the costs in the overall project, but it's a way we can cut costs and paperwork with any project. And so these are what these two IGAs are for us to, to basically uh, do document this arrangement. Okay, Council, do you have any questions for Chris? No? All right, public comment, eight o'clock. Does the cameraman want to come down? And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and we got public, we got public who just came in. Do you have any public, we have public comment for IGAs with water districts, do you want to? I have no comment. <laughs> he grabbed that seat real fast. Chris has heard enough from me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Seeing none, we'll close public comment at 8 o'clock and I'll entertain further discussion or two separate motions, please. I move to approve Ordinance 9.273 on second reading. Second. Motion by Debbie and a second by Renee. Council, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. I move to approve ordinance number 9.274 in second reading. Second. That would be a motion by Josh and a second by John. Council, go ahead and vote on those little voting devices you have right there. And that would come out with a unanimous approval of that item. Thank you very much. With no further business before council, we will adjourn at 8.01 p.m.